In Asia, how is business for Comtech and what sort of trends are you seeing? Um, in Asia, we've been doing really, really well. We have um, a lot of business in China throughout uh, most of Asia, but in China specifically, we've done a lot of business in emergency restoration. So services that need to be put in place after earthquakes, catastrophic events, natural disasters. And we see this being adopted by China and other countries are kind of looking to China to see what they've done for catastrophic restoration of cellular, ISP, etc. Um, that's been a big part of our business and it's had a large amount of growth over last year and we expect that to continue this year. Now, high-speed trunking is a big growth area, and I know Comtech are involved in that. How and with what products? So high-speed trunking is something that um, we've really focused on over the past two or three years. We have a new product out called the CDM 760 or 760, and the all the technologies that we've developed on some of our low-end modems, high-speed packet processing, uh, WAN optimization have now been ported over to this high speed product both for ISP restoration, uh, government services, government restoration projects, um, as well as a huge uh, number of GSM backhaul, cellular backhaul services. So we have a lot of technologies that we've developed in various products that we've kind of all aggregated into our high speed trunking modem which is, again, the CDM 760, and we're trying to position that modem so that it can address the geo satellites today, but it also has um, very high symbol rates and things that allow us to address the KA band market, which we believe is going to be coming on strong in the next couple of years. Now, walking around the show, and I've bumped into the GVF, who are a big, you know, proponents of dealing with satellite interference, you have the Meta Carrier product and you're supporting uh, Carrier ID. What is the problem with satellite interference? Are we dealing with it? Are Comtech dealing with it? Yeah, great question. So um, we're trying to do our part, let's say. We're certainly not the answer to all interference, um, but um, two years ago we spoke with a lot of the, uh, well, the big four satellite operators and uh, the operators kind of all had this same message, which is, is there anything you can do to help with interference? And there's lots of different kinds of interference. There's intentional interference, things like jamming, uh, people intentionally putting up carriers, uh, jamming for military purposes, things like that. But it turns out there's a lot of interference that's due to just operator error, antenna mispointing, um, fat fingering the product, if you will. And that's kind of been labeled unintentional interference. And we thought about the problem for a little while, and there is a technology that we call MetaCarrier or Carrier ID that uh, we implemented about two years ago that kind of embeds a secret little message in an SCPC carrier so that if someone is doing something by accident, unintentionally, an operator can use a special demodulator and they can see the identification of that carrier and so if that guy comes up in the wrong frequency, in the wrong pole, the wrong satellite, an operator who has this receiver decoder can take a look at that carrier, they can see the unique identifier, and then they can contact the owner of some global database and say, hey, who is this gentleman? We need to ask him to pull down his carrier, do something to rectify the problem. So uh, according to the, the, the operators that we spoke with, unintentional interference accounts for almost 70% of all interference issues. Um, so we think that we bring something to the table for everyone to benefit from. Um, it's become a DVB standard, and now it's also been adopted by Etsy, so it's now an Etsy standard. And, you know, hopefully everyone can benefit from this, and, you know, it's not really a, uh, a large profit maker for our company, but it really is something the industry needed, and, and, and we tried to address it. Do you think they'll ever be able to eradicate satellite interference? Never. Is there enough will? Never. You will never eradicate satellite interference. I mean, obviously, we all want to take the right steps to provide as much help as we can. But to, to, to you know, when you say, can we ever eradicate something? I, I mean, 
I just don't believe that you can ever yeah. get rid of something 100%. I think, I think we're taking a huge step. Um, the GVF and the IRG are taking other steps to train people how to point VSAT antennas. VSAT systems happen to be a, a large uh, part of interference. So some of it's training, some of it's technology, and then some of it's just mean-hearted individuals, and I don't think we're, yeah. uh, we're ever going to get rid of them. Now, Comtech, a very successful company, have been for many years. What are the trends going forward? Can you see any obstacles that you're going to have to go around? Yeah, so there are obstacles, and, you know, in the satellite community, our, our, our biggest enemy is the terrestrial guys, if you will. You know, we, we all compete with each other, but in the end of the day, our, our biggest competition is terrestrial. And even in markets where we've been historically wildly successful, uh, like uh, Africa and places like this, fiber is definitely coming in. Um, and because of that, there's new opportunities, but there's also, you know, loss of revenue. So there are companies that are coming out with satellite technologies that that can compete with fiber in some level. Um, they're not going to compete with fiber if the fiber is already laid, but they might compete with fiber or terrestrial uh, communications in such a way that it's not worth it for the fiber guy to go out to that location because we now have these high throughput satellites, you know, the O3Bs of the world, the Epics of the world. Um, these guys are lowering the price per bit where satellite is still viable and where we can compete possibly not on a perfectly level playing ground, but it's gonna prevent a lot of fiber systems from going into locations where where before maybe it would have been a slam dunk answer. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Africa there. And, right. You know, two years ago, everybody was saying, the answer to our problems is the African region. It's Africa, right. That hasn't really happened, does it? Yeah, I mean, we, we do a substantial amount of business in Africa, but Africa itself isn't going to make up for all of the rest of the continents that we have to deal with. And although business in Africa uh, is is good for us, we a huge part of our business comes from Asia, Europe, the US, and those markets are gonna remain uh, critically important for us. If we if we put all, all of our eggs in the Africa basket, we're, we're certainly gonna go hungry. Every year I come here um, into Asia, and everybody I interview says, Asia is a fragmented market. Is Africa as fragmented as Asia? Nobody ever says Africa's fragmented. Well, define fragmented for me. In what, in what sense? Uh, diverse regulation, diverse systems, diverse nature of the consumer oh, and customer. Yeah, certainly. I mean, th there are, are different legal issues um, that we have to deal with in dealing with Africa. Uh, I would say in, in those terms, Africa is just as fragmented as, as Asia. You know, uh, certainly Asia has a lot, a lot more governing bodies than Africa does, but there's always governing bodies that uh, that you have to play with and deal with in, in, in any place that we do business. And I don't, I don't see that going away. You know, some would argue that's a source of revenue for some of these places, and, and, and maybe it is, but you know, they have their own concerns, and and we have to play by the the rules that they uh, that they create. Lou, thank you very much. Thank you very much.